going to speak to you today about slaying the emperor of all maladies. What do I mean by that? Can I have the first slide, please? Well, I'm referring to the best-selling and recent Pulitzer Award-winning novel uh, by uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee called The Emperor of All Maladies, in which he's speaking about <clears throat> excuse me, cancer. This is a biography of cancer. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't think this is all showing. Oh, there it is. Um, cancer was first described in the Greek literature, although it was reported in some Egyptian papyri 3,500 years ago. They gave it the name Kirkinus. And I thought it more appropriate to use a Greek mythological figure and an empress, a Gorgon empress by the name of Medusa, to uh, epitomize cancer. The many demons on the head are each different kinds of cancer. And of course, we have the stony death that she induced in m many thousands of people. And in fact, we have nearly 8 million deaths per year worldwide due to cancer. 14% of these are breast cancer. But what we really need is a hero like the Greek hero Perseus to come along who through gifts of the gods in the form of a sword and a shield was actually able to slay uh, Medusa and we would like to have some magic utensils like that in order to get rid of all cancer. And I would like to propose that maybe we aren't too far off from that if we are clever and use the tools that we have wisely. The problem with this book, uh, in my mind, is that I didn't like the way it ended. And so I would like to give you a new ending, one that's a little more optimistic. Because, <clears throat> in fact, Dr. Mukherjee, who's an oncologist at Columbia, really began to admire cancer for its ability to take on the immortal features that humankind has been looking forward for many eons. And he became, he decided that cancer cells are actually more perfect versions of ourselves. Furthermore, he concludes that we are probably fatally conjoined to this ancient illness. Now, I would take issue with both of these comments, and so rewrite the ending. But he does point out in the history, the 40-year war on cancer that began in 1971, even though there were earlier research, that one of the first findings actually came out of Africa. You heard about this a little while ago. It's the Madagascar periwinkle, the source of an important chemotherapy agent, vincristine, and three others that have since been derived. <clears throat> Importantly, <clears throat> excuse me, this agent was used in combination with other early chemotherapy agents to help eradicate from Africa an endemic illness that was taking the lives of many young African men and women, Burkitt's lymphoma. So we have two early examples of how Africa has already contributed to the eradication of cancer. And I think more can be done. Now, <clears throat> drugs have always been part of the oncologist toolkit. Then and now, as you heard earlier, plants and other natural sources provide these compounds up to over 50% of the time. Around the 1850s, at least in the US, we had a mixture of potions and extracts to work with, but it wasn't until uh, 1980 or so that we had our first half dozen of chemically proven uh, oncology agents, chemotherapeutics, such as the vincristine. <clears throat> Future of oncology, however, is in targeted therapeutics. For these diagrams shown here are actually uh, areas of research in my lab at the Buck Institute, and I will come back to the one in the center bottom as a hopeful way of treating a form of breast cancer, which I think is a uniquely African form of breast cancer. So we may not have the magic tools that Perseus had in the form of a sword and a shield, but we do have an expanding toolkit. And just as important the number of tools that you have is knowledge of the tool and the task at hand. Obviously, you may have a lot of good tools, but if you can't apply them to the job correctly or you don't understand the task at hand, they are useless. I would like to tell you that we have plenty of oncology chemotherapy agents now, only about a half a dozen of which are being used to treat breast cancer patients. Perhaps it's because we don't understand breast cancer as well as we'd like, including the form that you have here in Africa. So worldwide, we know that there's a greater than hundredfold variation in breast cancer, and more importantly, that incidence is increasing 
both in the countries that have the highest incidence, like the US and Western Europe, and in the countries that have the lowest incidence, such as in Africa and certain areas of Asia. So in Madagascar in particular, where you have one of the world's lowest incidence of breast cancer, you have projected to have one of the highest increases in breast cancer occurring in the next 20 years through demographic features alone. A 213% increase in breast cancer is projected. In the US, where we have the world's highest incidence of breast cancer, the projected increase is much smaller, 44%, perhaps even less. So why is this? Is, why is there this variation in breast cancer incidence and the projection of this is so different? The reason is shown here. Here you see many countries shown in the little balls <clears throat> and you have their population uh, on the, uh, sorry, the average lifespan on the bottom axis and on the vertical axis, <clears throat> you have the breast cancer incidence going up and you see First of all, Madagascar, with a very low, relatively low uh, average lifespan, maybe just under, under 60, uh, but has a very low breast cancer incidence. What will happen as the lifespan of average Madagascarans increase? Will it go to become the incidence that we see in the US, five times higher than what you have here? Or will it become like the incidence in Japan, which is much lower? And as you just heard from Dr. Kennedy, research at the Buck Institute on longevity actually suggests that we can lengthen human lifespan and actually decrease the incidence of cancers like breast cancer. So it's possible to do, do even better. The question is adopting the right lifestyle to prevent the increases that come with so many uh, well-developed countries and their high rates of breast cancer incidence. Here again you see in the left panel the very low in blue line incidence of breast cancer in Madagascar relative to the world or the United States which has the highest incidence and this is with age on the lower axis. But on the right you also see another disturbing figure and that is that while Madagascar has its world's lowest breast cancer incidence it has a very high breast cancer mortality rate. Now there are many reasons for that and we've heard some of these this afternoon. But one of them might be that Africa has a different kind of breast cancer one that perhaps isn't well represented in the US figures. So here's how the pathologist sees breast cancer. We've seen a little bit of that this afternoon. These are stains. There are over 20 different types of breast cancers as identified by the, by the pathologist through these kinds of stains. And for 50 years, we've been trying to understand breast cancer through these visual mechanisms. But in fact, <clears throat> We've also learned that the architecture of breast cancer is quite complicated. It's actually a disease of communication between cells as well as a genetic defect within the cancer cell. And as you develop the lethal metastases, there's an adaptation, almost an evolution of the cancer that changes to making every little metastatic deposit a little bit different than the others. But these actually do not predict very well what will happen to the average woman that has breast cancer diagnosed and, and uh, over the next 10 or 20 years? Will she develop a metastasis and die from this? 20 years, this can happen, this process can happen. And in the lower left, you see graphs of the various organ sites where breast cancer metastases can take place. And those are based upon Western figures. What we do know is that the the pattern and frequency of metastases from Madagascar and African breast cancers are actually a little bit different, suggesting again that Africa has a different kind of breast cancer. Now, we have diagnostic toolkit that's been improving that's well beyond the histology right now. And in fact, without even knowing what the cancer looks like under a microscope, we can take out its RNA and DNA and apply tests that not only give us a million data points, but even up to a billion data points on a given tumor. These tests are being done today. In fact, <clears throat> I'm part of a group known as the Cancer Genome Atlas Group in the US that is completing an analysis of 500 breast cancers, getting a billion data points from every cancer. And the data is being done on things, on microscopic sli side slides. Now, what are we gonna learn from that? Here's one kind of data we're learning. This is on the top line, you have about several hundred cancers, 
breast cancer included and other kinds of cancers. On the vertical line, you're having thousands of different genes, all the genes in those cancer cells that are either expressed at a high level or a low level. The high level is red, the low level is green. And what you see automatically is that the cancers sort themselves out by the type without even the pathologist telling us what they are. They are self-sorting by just the pattern of gene expression. But more importantly, when we look at breast cancer, we can see that it is subdivided into four or five types. And these four or five types give us more information than the pathologist can because they tell us which ones are going to be more aggressive and they can tell us which kinds are responding to therapy. And instead of doing these complicated tests, we now, through understanding these genes, can actually reduce the test, the diagnostic test, down to a few simple stains that can be done in a community laboratory. Ultimately, what we've learned is that there's one type, the basal-like breast cancer, which is actually a uniquely African type of breast cancer. In fact, it may be evolutionarily the first form of breast cancer. Uh, eight, over 80% of African breast cancers in some countries are of this basal-like. In comparison to non-blacks in the U.S. that have 15%, 16% or less breast cancers of this type. Now these kinds of basal-like or African breast cancers, as I will call them, actually have different risk factors in biology. They're not eligible for targeted therapies like I was suggesting was the future of our therapy. And that's because we don't know targets in these cancers to attack. <clears throat> well, understanding the levels of the genes that are expressed is where we are today, but where we will be tomorrow, and this work is going on today, is to know how these genes are talking to each other through network analysis. And if I can have the next slide, the best way to understand is to take a look at how people talk to each other on the internet. Here is an internet section from 2003. The different colors of the lines are represent the different countries in which the uh, internet connection was established. And you can see that there are very bright spots in this network. And you might want to ask, well, if I was going to disrupt this network, how would I do it? I suspect you would all take that scissor and cut at those very bright spots. Well, we can do this with cancer. So the network nodes, as they're called, that I showed you earlier are easily identified and the names of several of them are put here. And we have drugs that can attack each of these nodes. But we have to be smart. We have to be more like Perseus who had a very powerful sword that could cut through marble and could cut off the head of Medusa. But he had to use cleverness and trickery. And we have to do the same because these same nodes work in normal cells. And we don't want to destroy our normal cells in our body. So we have been working on, and I've been working on this for 10 years, and we have it coming into clinical trial this month, actually, a special way of delivering the therapies, the drugs that can hit those nodes in a very specialized way so that they only attack the cancer cells. We've been able to find four surface targets on the African-type breast cancer, that basal-like breast cancer, that aren't overexpressed in the other types of breast cancer. We've created antibodies that can attack those, only those. We've coupled those antibodies to what we call nanoparticles, little fat vessels, vesicles, that each contain 10,000 molecules of drug, some very powerful drugs. But because they're contained very stably like that, they aren't released and the rest of the body doesn't see them. And by targeting the antibodies to these nanoparticles in what's for, called nanotherapeutics, we can now attack those nodes and we can eradicate cancer, and breast cancer in particular, subtypes of breast cancer depending upon those specific uh, surface antigens, and thereby spare the rest of the cells, the rest of the body, the cells in the body that are normal, the toxic effects of chemotherapy. Finally, I would like to say that I think that we are poised to, to beat cancer. The war will be won. I think that progress begins by seeing things differently. At the Buck Institute, we try to see things and think about things differently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia, for inviting me.